<laughs> I need to make a bot for this. We're almost basically halfway into the book. So, um, if you want, uh, let me see. I also typed up this too. So that's the gist of the story so far, uh, the, of the summary of the what's going on in this world type shit. That's from the book itself, mind you. So if you haven't been here for the previous uh, sessions, this is session five of the same same book. Um, I suggest checking out the playlist. Uh, but if you still want to sit and chill with us, that's cool. Um, there will be spoilers, but, you know, you'll be fine, right? <laughs> but for now, I'm just drawing the next scene that they're going to. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like I'm practically drunk drawing this because this is like, everything's like, not going the right direction. I feel like I'm fucking drunk drawing this shit. So right now, what basically happened so far is that the characters have come across um, this gas station where they're going to stop and rest at because one of the characters are wounded. This gas station is somewhat of a uh, of a concoction of a gas station, convenience store, and a bait shop. Yeah, my sense of perspective is not good today. But we're just trying to we're just trying to make this store believable for the most part. I honestly skipped like two weeks of this before, so I decided this week I was going to do it, no matter, um, I, I felt like doing it, it wasn't like I forced myself, but, um, yeah. My energy was a little bit more hyped earlier, but it kind of died down after I had to do something real quick. Hi, Anita. What's good? I have not seen you in a hot minute. 
How are you? How are you? I'm crying. Thank you for the five pretty bits, Anita. Yeah, it's been a while. How are you? I saw that you streamed the other day. I think I had fallen asleep though, so I missed it. Life, damn. Are you doing better now? Stable? Hey. It's, go it's okay, I'm going back into streaming. Yeah, I got a stable job now. Oh, okay, yeah. That's lit. It's great to have you back, Anita. Which ain't the same without you. Yes, you too, Anita. Yeah, girl. Well, while you were gone, we started a read and draw uh, series. I think I told you about this before, right? I don't know if you were there when I mentioned it um, a few times with everybody. It's It's been like the... Um, we uh, I read and then I draw something with while they uh well, while we uh take breaks from the book. Working on schedules like what days to stream and times. Oh, okay. Well, I'm doing them. This is now session five of it. Yeah, we've been reading like the same book so far for these five sessions. We're almost halfway through the book. A lot of things have happened and it's very intense. Then again, that's mainly a lot of the books I usually read. Intense type shit. If I don't feel like my gut is being ripped out from, from my heart, then that's, that's not my story. Really said, I better feel the gunshot to my head when I read a book. I'm just saying, fam, if I don't hear the bang in my head, um, it ain't my book. That's not the story for me, fam.
When do you stream those two? I stream the read and draw sessions every Saturday. I try to stream them at at least 12 p.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. If not, then somewhere around a little later than that day. I try to start them a little early in the day, more than I usually do for most of my streams. Uh, and depending on how long it takes me to draw a scene and how long are the chapters, I try to read at least 10 chapters a stream. These can easily become five hour streams. Yeah, 10 chapters. I know, that's why I draw, so that it gives me, gives my voice breaks in between. Because if not, my voice sounds very, starts to get very raspy and rugged <laughs> towards the end. That's why I was already looking for a break in between. I'll put those in my calendar, too. Oh, uh, Anita! Yeah, if you want to um check out the previous chapters, um I put them <gasps> I put them on a playlist, so you have already a collection if you'd like to listen to them while drawing. <laughs> already in the set set for you. There's four four chapter uh four sessions already i don't know how many hours that's already is probably like <laughs> probably already like 20 hours or some shit but uh yeah it's a really good it's a really good book if you become an interested in it i totally recommend checking out the other books to it i don't have the other books on on me at the moment so when we do finish this book uh, it'll be a while before i get the next book I'll basically end up having people vote for the next book. Exciting, yeah. I love how Radio was so shook about that. Yes, nigga, I read 10 chapters of this shit. It's a lot to do by voice, but it's definitely worth it once I'm done. It gets as much. I'd pass out. I'm crying. I mean, I do get a little woozy towards the end. <laughs> Reading half a chapter? Oh, shit. Oh, wait. I mean, I, I'm a streamer, though, so technically, I already talk a lot as it is. So my body should be used to it, shit. Even if I talk lowly. <laughs> Yo, I feel bad when I have to start reading though, cause um, Francis was here earlier when I stopped stream, and now I'm not sure if he knows that I started streaming again. Cause he was saying he'll he would uh catch it when I streamed again from the break. Uh, I will. He was like the main one typing earlier too, and now you're the main one typing along with Anita now. You missing a party?
I'm dead out here thinking I heard you say along with Panini. Oh, Panini? Who's Panini? I'm weak. This is starting to look like a gas station slash convenience store now. On some little Nas X chowder shit on weed. Is this a background for something? Uh, this actually doesn't have any characters in it because the characters are looking at this scene. They are looking at this abandoned uh, gas station slash convenience store slash bait shop and are about to go inside. So this is just the scene right before they go inside this place.
I don't know, close enough. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Raggedy ass. Raggedy ass. Convenient. Convenient arms. Um, Gas station, shit. Close enough. I think that's good enough for the, uh... Yeah, <laughs> just a little fly right there. And there we go. This is the convenience store, kind of, that they came across. <laughs> uh, Alright, um... Time to read the next. Uh, time to read the next part. So, for those of you just now coming in, what just happened in chapter thirty-four, the first paragraph, first two paragraphs, is that. It's been three days after the incident where everything was taken from them, including Ellie and the dog. Tom is wounded, and Alex is taking Tom by foot to the next place that they can rest at, you know? And he is injured in his leg, and the leg has not started healing at all since the past three days, still bleeding. And they come across this gas station, slash convenience store, slash bait shop. And they look at it, see if it's kind of, if it seems safe enough to go in, and uh, they're about to go inside. So that's where we are. The front door was shut tight, though the windows were intact, which might mean there was someone home. The snow in the parking lot was unbroken, un uh, was unbroken except for animal tracks, probably deer. She took a tentative, experimental sniff, got nothing but the scent of motor oil and gasoline. Her eyes flicked to her left wrist. Mickey said it was five minutes to four. Going to be dark soon, and it feels empty, she said. I'm going to take a look around back. Okay. Might want to have that Glock handy, though. We may not be the only people looking for a place to spend the night. He was right. She dug under her coat, pulled her gun from its holster, then, then unfolded to a stand. Even that small movement made her head swirled with vertigo. And she put a hand on the woodpile to steady herself. You all right? Tom's voice rose with concern. Fine, she lied. Her, ha her hands were jittery, and she felt water weak and nauseated. Her stomach was a raw, empty pit. A person could theoretically survive on nothing but water for a week or so. And while they'd found some food, Alex wasn't sure how much longer she could manage on a theory. 
They had come across seven houses since losing Ellie, and each had already been picked almost completely clean, and that included the bodies. At the very last house, they'd been lucky, but only because they'd cut across a field, and Tom had spotted a glint of glass far back in the woods. The glass turned out to be the only window left in an otherwise ramshackle hunting cabin. The door was so old that the boards had contracted, leaving wide gaps, and snow had blown in through the ruined windows. There wasn't much in the way of furniture, just a tattered, mouse-eaten couch and two broken straight back chairs. But Alex had dug out a ratty knapsack from one of the bedrooms. They'd hit the mother load in the kitchen. Some twine, a stub of candle, an old battered aluminum saucepan, a can of sterno, a jug of bleach, nearly gone, three empty water bottles, four tins of sardines, a third of a jar of mixed nuts, a half jar of chicken flavored boily, boy, boy, bo, what? Boil on? Boil on? Um, this, this is not an English word. Cubes. <laughs> Chicken flavored cubes <laughs> and four pouches of beef jerky that had somehow escaped the mice. That had been two days ago, and they were down to one tin of sardines, four cubes, and three pouches of jerky. She kept the empty nut jar for the bleach and used the drop whenever they need to purify more drinking water. She'd supplemented their starvation rations with a handful of tiny minnows yesterday, using Tom's undershirt as a net to fish them up with a small stream. Otherwise, Tom wasn't eating much, mostly drinking chicken broth and water, and his face, already thin, was gaunt. Their only weapons were Alex's boot knife and Glock, and neither wanted to waste bullets hunting game. Things might have been different if they stayed in one place, had a cozy cabin or tent, set up deadfalls, and, oh yes, had bait. But Tom was getting worse, and their progress was very slow. Much worse than when she'd been with Ellie, because Tom could only hobble, and needed to rest often as they moved southwest, going by memory and dead reckoning. Tom hoped that Brett had listened and gone west. If so, they would have, ha they would have to go past rule. If Harlan was right, Maybe the people there had let them all in. So when Tom and Alex showed, Ellie would be there. Maybe. The only thing Alex was interested in now was finding help for Tom. She just hoped she found it in time. She cautiously wound her way behind the shop. She, she spotted a corroded truck on blocks and an open dumpster piled with collapsed cardboard boxes, backed, backed against a stand of hard wood. At the base of the dumpster, a trio of rusty paint cans were arranged in a little pyramid alongside a quartet of snow-covered tires, piled like discarded tindly winks. Thanks for following, Rosita. Welcome to the palace. I hope you enjoy your stay here. There was a back door with an unsecured screen held open by snow that had filtered in through the mesh. Hi, Nene. What are we reading? Same book as the last four sessions. We're reading Ashes by Isla J. Bick. And if you're curious about the summary... There's a playlist set up, so if you want to check out the last four sessions, those are there. We usually do these every Saturdays. I did skip the last two Saturdays, though, so that's why if you were here the previous Saturdays, that's why I didn't do them. I didn't in the last two Saturdays. But the past uh, last month or so, I had been doing these. So, yeah. Let me see. The screen protested with a loud, grating squall that made Alex wince. 
When she tried the knob, it turned, and she nudged the door open with the toe of her boot. She tensed, waiting for the boom of a shotgun, but nothing happened. She stepped into a small, black, a small back hall. A pegboard with hooks was tacked to the wall from which a jacket still hung. The jacket was light blue, with darker blue stretchy cuffs, and Ned embroidered in the black thread over the left breast pocket. A pair of boots rested on the floor. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. The summary doesn't even tell you half of it, to be honest. Shit gets really crazy in this book. So if you're interested, do check out the other sessions. And if you still want to sit and hang with us, then... Yeah. <laughs> then be ready for some spoilers, Lenini. Yeah. It sucks. I do try and let y'all know that these things happen, but it's kind of hard to catch everyone and be like, Hey, this is happening. So, yeah. Uh, let me see. Another door opened to a short, narrow hall. There was a stinking bathroom to the left. The toilet had been used since the power went out, and it overflowed in a foul, reeking mess. Alex could see, farther on down the hall, the front door in one wing of a crispy cream case. Then the smell more powerful than the shit stink from the toilet hit her. Gassy as a sewer and bad enough to make her stomach crawl into her throat, she knew what she'd find. The store was a mess. Bare shelves, empty boxes, burst juice boxes, a squashed donut that had tumbled from an otherwise empty Krispy Kreme display case. Someone had dropped a carton of eggs in front of the dead coolers. Smashed shells and exploded yolk, mingled with a lake of milk, desiccated to a snot-colored crust. The coolers were empty. To the right of the front door were shelves of fan belts, quarts of oil, and jugs of antifreeze and windshield wiper fluid that looked relatively untouched. The same, however, could not be said of the dead guy. The corpse lay in a pool of dried blood near the front of the store. Most of his face was gone. Without lips or most of his gums, his teeth stained yellow from cigarettes, with some half-rotted, tilted, like tent pegs about to blow over in a storm. The back of his shirt and his jeans were chewed to ruins. The muscles and skin of his limbs stripped off the bone neatly, as if he were fried chicken. Three weeks ago, a month, six weeks, Alex probably would have thrown up or run screaming, or both. Now, she studied the floor. There had been a few animals, wolves, she thought, maybe a couple of dogs, and several people. The floor was a stencil of rusty shoe prints. The prints were all old, that line's not even tacky. But then as her eyes swept across the tracks, she paused. Someone had been barefoot. What's good, Cynthia? Welcome to session five of Read and Draw. They read Robinson Crusoe in fourth grade, as she remembered it. When Crusoe finds Friday's footprint, he's terrified, believing, the, believing that the devil might be on the island. But then what surprises Crusoe more... Oh god, wait, home. Um, Alright. Uh, is the discovery that after being alone for so long, the idea of other people scares the hell out of him. Looking down at those footprints, she thought of Crusoe. They had not seen any brain-zapped kids, or even signs that they'd been anywhere around the houses or farms. Frankly, she hoped they were all dead. She hoped that with only half a brain, the cannibal kid was too stupid to come in out of the cold. I've got the bread, where's my child? Wait, what? I'm crying, Grizzly, get out! <laughs> I'm crying. Grizzly, it took you like <laughs> almost a whole week to come back. <laughs> oh, Lord.
Oh, Lord. <laughs> Welcome, Grizzly, to Read and Draw. This is Session 5 of Ashes by Isla J. Bick. Ilsa. I had to make it myself. There were complications. What in the world? All right. <laughs> But yeah, if you aren't sure what this story is about, here is the summary. This is session five. If you don't mind spoilers, then you can come and hang with us. There is a playlist for the rest if you do want to check it out the others and listen so you can catch up for what's going on. She butted open the front door, and then moved the body, dragging the dead man by his feet, hoping they wouldn't come off. It wasn't as bad as she thought it might be, or maybe she was getting numb to the whole thing. Anyway, it had to be done, because there was no way she was spending the night under the same roof as a corpse. After the relative respite offered by the store, the cold was a shock. The wind had picked up. An icy snow needled her face, but she was relieved to breathe air that didn't smell like decaying Ned. She thought about getting the work shirt from the back room before dark to cover the dead man's face, and then decided that they had more use for it. She felt an urge to apologize to Ed, to Ned, but didn't. Tom was shuddering from with cold by the time she went back for him. She half supported half dragged him inside, eased him to the floor, and then combed the entire store. There was no food, although Alex discovered an unopened water bottle that rolled under the Krispy Kreme case. Near the front door, she unearthed a package of AA batteries behind an overturned magazine rack. Whoever had ransacked the place hadn't cared if he caught a cold, and, and had left fistful of aspirin and Tylenol and cold remedies in these little foil packets, as well as packet. Oh, oh fuck. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Just my brain. As well as packages of Kleenex and tins of throat lozenges. What in the world is that? Behind the checkout counter, the register's cash drawer was open and empty. Not surprisingly, there were no cigarettes or tins of chewing tobacco. But what did amaze Alex was that the plastic lottery ticket dispenser were also empty. Like there would like there would near be another multi gazillion dollar powerball jackpot in the very near future. Yeah, that's pretty dumb. Unless it's used for kindling. <laughs> there was a back office behind the counter. The door was locked, but the keys still hung in a nail next to the cash register. Inside the office was a plain metal desk and a swivel chair on squeaky casters. In the desk, she found a few pens, two pencils, three paper clips, rubber bands, and in the bottom drawer, a bottle of Maker's Marks, half full. She left the jugs of windshield wiper fluid and antifreeze, but crammed the rest into her knapsack. She lingered over the cans of WD-40 and Deezer. The quartz of oil thought th thought thought that all, what that what thought that of them all what in the world the oil might be good. Soak some rags in oil, throw them in a plastic bag in case it can find tinder for a fire. Then she tore open a packet of Tylenol, made Tom swallow back the medicine, and then the rest of the water. It was very cold inside the store. But Tom's face glistened with perspiration. His hair was damp, but when she put her hand against his forehead, his skin was very hot. You've got a fever, she said. In, in, infection. He was shaking so badly, she heard the click of his teeth. I c c can s smell it. So she, so she, so could she. Fuck. <laughs> Why am I stuttering like Tom? <laughs> So could she. Even without her spidey senses. When she took down the bandage, she had to clamp down she had to clamp back on a moan. The wound was very bad. 
The bullet had gone in a little left of center, about six inches below Tom's hip. His thigh was swollen and tight. The skin flushed, shiny and hot to the touch. The edges of the wound were black, and when he moved, a thick worm of blood streaked green pus buzzled up, bubbled up and ran down the side of his leg. The bandages were oozy and sopping with a mixture of blood and more pus. I don't think I can walk much more, he said. You walk today. Too slow. So what? It's fine. I'm not leaving you behind. You ha have to. He let his head fall back. His eyes half shuddered. His lips were split and bleeding. You would never leave me, or Ellie. You'd carry us if you'd have to. D don't be too sure about th that. I could make a stretcher. His head moved in a weak negative. Just slow you down. We're not getting anywhere f fast this way. You'll be a lot f faster on your own. She would be. She knew that. Alone. She could cover twice as much ground in half the time. And if she kept heading southwest, she would run into rule. If Larry was right, if Marjorie and Brett and Harlan were to be believed, whoever was there would want to help Tom. Or maybe something else that Larry had said would be true. They'll shoot you on sight. We don't have to decide anything right now. Come on. She gave him a little shake. You know medical stuff. Think. Would it help if I, I don't know, we got that gunk out of there? He gave a sluggish, sluggish nod. C couldn't hurt. Okay, just, just give me a few minutes. I want to check the cars. At the very least, we can use the mats. Better for you than lying on the floor. The Toyota was closest to the front door, and she searched it first. The car was barren and cold as a freezer. Her breath came in clouds as she hurriedly piled floor mats on the front seat. Then she thought, trunk. Reaching in, she found the right button, popped the release, heard the trunk click open. Jackpot. Inside the truck was a collapsible shovel and three signal flares. They could use the flares for fires if they have to. Was there a way to reuse the striker? Tom might know. The shovel was for camping, with a triangular steel head and a removable ha handle that unscrewed to reveal a six-inch blade saw. She pulled the shovel out to its full length, felt the heft in her hand. From the condition of the head, she didn't think the shovel had ever been used. Backing out with the truck mat, her eyes fell on a corner of white and red protruding from beneath the spare tire. Putting aside the mat, she reached for the bit of color. Was that? She felt a little squirt of adrenaline, which she tr which she tried to qu which she tried to quash. But she knew as soon as her shaking fingers touched the cardboard, and then she was carefully prying the Mar Marlboro box free. Interesting place to keep a sash, but she heard people squirreling away drugs and spare tires. So it may be not so strange if you didn't want your wife or husband to know you couldn't quite kick the habit. The Marl... Bar I don't know how to say this word. Marl... 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 Carl! <laughs> the Mar... 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 I'm going to call it the Burrow. The Barra Box, because I don't know how to say this word. It's a brand. I don't care for it. I don't know how to say it. I, I'm sorry. The burner box rattled and smelled like cold tar. She didn't care about the cigarettes. But if someone had sashed the pack into the trunk for a rainy day, he'd need a light. She was almost afraid to look, but she did. Inside the box were three cigarettes. She let her breath go. A matchbook. The book had once been white, but was now gray. She could still make out the words beneath a stylized martini glass. Eddie Martinis. 
and in much smarter in and in whoa and in much smaller letters below that the restaurant's address and phone number. She held the matchbook between her fingers for several seconds, thinking, "You just watch. There won't be any matches left. There won't, but there were a half dozen." She let out a whoop. Tom. Elated, she ducked out of the trunk. Shovel in one hand, the matchbook held high in the other, and then the stink of rotting flesh cut through the lingering aroma of stale tobacco. Later, she would wonder if things might have turned out differently if she ha hadn't just inhaled a snip full of Marlboro. Of, of burrow, fuck. But that would be later. Now she saw not just one or two. Now she, now she saw not just one kid or two, she saw three. Sorry. Today, my brain is like, LOL, what's reading? <laughs> we are now at chapter 35. She ha She's meeting her... She's having her third... um Third intersection with the zombie kids. This is her third time seeing the zombie kids. So, they're right outside the gas station. They just started to um, r rest in set camping and Tom is unfortunately injured inside as well so I think the, the zombie kids are positioned where they're in the way of her getting inside the gas station and I'm pretty sure they see her ass as much as she sees them so yeah things are about to get more fucked than it already is <laughs> how more fucked can you get in the situation like you lose all your supplies. You lose your only transportation in the apocalypse. You lost one of your members who was a child and the dog, a dog who could help you sense the zombies. You lost all of that. Then the one you love has also been shot and injured and is dying with an infected leg. And right when things were starting to look up, there's some zombie kids chilling, looking at you waiting for you and it's like oh no <laughs> oh no <laughs> what a day hashtag couldn't be me could not be me <clears throat> chapter 35. Two boys and a girl, and they were very close, no more than 20 feet away. And between her and the front door of the station, judging from the snarl of leaves and debris in the girl's hair, they must have come from the woods behind the gas station. They were filthy and dressed in a motley assortment of clothes that couldn't be their own. The boys were older, maybe in their early 20s. The oldest, lanky with a flop of black hair, wore a woman's pink fur-trimmed parka. The other boy was very fat, wore the remnants of a tattered black poncho, so thoroughly used that he looked like a Batman blimp passed through a shredder. The girl was her age, Alex thought. Somewhere along the way, the girl had picked up a man's torn camouflage pants in a too small smeary gray pea coat that rode midway up her arms. Every inch of skin not covered by clothes were a swirl of dirt and blood, and what was either engine oil or feces, probably both. The left sleeve was mangled, as if the girl had caught her arm on a branch and simply yanked until the wool ripped. The girl shifted. And Alex saw, peeking beneath her pants, tattered cuffs, a single sneaker on the girl's right foot. The girl's left foot was bare, save for an anklet of bloody sock. Alex thought back to the blood prints in the store, and, with a sudden sinking twist, realized that the footprint Robinson Crusoe had seen did not belong to Friday. The print had been made by a cannibal. This cannibal, the girl, had a club, a polished length of what looked like very stout, very heavy wood, probably an axe handle. 
the car. She could dive in, lock the doors. But she was afraid to move. Her knees were wobbly. The Toyota's open back door looked a million miles away. Anyway, she couldn't just wait them out. The front door to the store was open, and so was the back. And if they caught in, they would find Tom. The girl rushed her. She was absolutely silent and insanely fast. Her weary arms lashed down in a blur. Her left hand hooked into a claw, the right swinging the club. Almost too late, Alex ducked. She heard the club weir through the space where her head had been on a second before. Then she screamed as a starburst of pain tore into her scalp. The girl had her by the hair, and now Alex was lurching forward, being pulled and dragged off her feet. Off balance, her boots tangling, she stumbled to the icy asphalt. Still clutching the shovel in her left hand, the matchbook went flying as she tumbled onto her back. She saw the blur of a club again as the girl cocked her elbow, and Alex jerked left just as the club axed down, crashing against the concrete with a solid thunk, so hard that the club splintered. A huge, ripping laser burned fire into her scalp, and she felt a stinging jolt. Then she was free, rolling away onto her hands and knees. Left with nothing but a bloody knot of Alex's hair and a toothpick of a club, the girl bawled in frustration. The boys had not moved. Alex didn't have time to wonder if maybe they took turns or simply thought the girl could handle her. Scrambling, Alex was just getting her foot under her, when the girl charged again. What happened next was pure instinct. Still crouched on the ground, Alex saw the girl coming, heard the slap of the bare feet, felt her fingers fist around the shovel. Her brain detached and her body simply took over, because then she was unfurling, driving forward, closing the gap. She fainted low, then aimed high. The shovel cut the air, blade on in a vicious chop. The sturdy metal edge sank into the soft, exposed flesh of the girl's neck. There was a great jet of spurting blood burning into the snow like red sprinkles on white icing. And then the girl was falling away, the momentum wrenching the shovel out of Alex's grasp. The girl sprawled, hands wrapped around her throat, gargling as blood pumped between her fingers. The shovel clattered to the ground. Her own momentum spun Alex almost completely around. Disoriented, she looked up, realized she was staring at the stalled caravan half in, half out of the gas station's driveway, and thought, Oh God, they're behind. She caught a papery flutter, the thud of boots against thick snow, and as she turned, a black rippling blur swooped in from her right. The gun, she thought suddenly. In her terror, she'd forgotten all about it. She fumbled the coat open. Wrapped her, hand, wrapped her fingers around the grip. The gun, the gun, the gun, the gun. Blimp Boy plowed into her. The Glock went flying. She saw it cartwheeling through the air. Heard the thunk as it hit the Toyota. Toyota, and then she was on the ground again. The boy using his weight to pin her down. The tattered plastic of the boy's poncho dragged at her arms like tentacles. And she thrashed, trying to bat her away. Trying to bat her way free. Gasping, she looked up to see the kid's lips twitching back from teeth that were stained and slimy with gore. No, she screamed as the boy's teeth flashed. Tom slammed into the boy. The blow knocked Blimp Boy onto his back, and then he and Tom were rolling, thrashing, grunting. The pudgy boy was snapping at Tom's face, his teeth clashing together. Tom ran the heel of, a ha of one hand into the boy's lower jaw. The pudgy boy let out a gurgling howl as his teeth drove into soft flesh of his, of his tongue. Rearing up, mouth drooling blood, the boy let loose with a vicious backhand to Tom's jaw. A solid crack, loud as a gunshot. Tom's hold slackened for just an instant. instant, and then there was a flash of bloody teeth as the pudgy boy's jaws battened down on Tom's neck, just above his right shoulder. Tom screamed. No, 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 no. Frantic, Alex clawed her way to her knees. Tom and Blimp Boy was still struggling, but even if Tom hadn't been sick and weak, the boy was much heavier and he was astride Tom. Tom's shirt was saturated with blood. Blimp Boy brought his cocked fist down. There was a sound like eggshells being crushed by a heavy boot, 
as the blow connected with Tom's nose, and then Tom went limp. Screaming, not even aware that she was moving, Alex grabbed up the fallen shovel, wound up, and then swung it with all her might. The shovel hit with a solid thunk. She felt the jump and sting of metal against her hand, and the force of the impact shiver up her arms. Howling, Blimp Boy went sprawling, but he was still conscious, already rolling onto his hands and knees. That's when she spied the butt of the clock sticking out from behind the rear tire of the Toyota. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Blimp Boy in all fours, shaking his head like a dog, and she reeled, and she reeled, grabbing for the gun. The third boy, whom she'd forgotten about, rammed her at a dead run. Yeah. Give me a sec. <sighs> to be honest, I probably should have drawn the kids. I just didn't feel like it. I could draw their silhouettes of anything, but nah, I'm not gonna draw them. The third boy, whom she had forgotten about, rammed her at a dead run. The blow drove Alex back against the unyielding metal of the Toyota. Alex felt a lightning surge of pain as the car's rear fender jammed her spine. Gagging, Alex sagged, and then she was on her back. 
the boy slashing with a claw fist. Alec's face fired white hot as the boy's nails scored her flesh from the corner of her left eye to the angle of her jaw. Alex tried twisting away, but the boy brought his bald fist against bald fist down like a hammer, catching her just above her ear. Her head banged the asphalt, and then a burst of wet copper filled her mouth. And then she lost a shovel. Dimly, her head singing with pain. Alex heard the boy screech again felt his hands closing around her throat, and then her air was gone. Her fingers scrambled over his, but he had her tight, and he was shaking her now, pounding her head against the snowy asphalt. The edges of her vision went red, and then black, and then the margins began to contract, growing smaller and tighter. Her lungs screamed, and her pulse thundered in her oxygen-starved brain. She fought, but his grip tightened. His thumbs crushed her throat, and the pain was huge. Not just a burn, but a sensation of something breaking in two, like a dry twig. Her arms and legs were no longer listening to her, and her hands began to loosen as her hold on consciousness started to slip sideway. To slip slide away. She was going numb the strength flowing from her like blood, and the pain too. The bitter cold was no more substantial now than smoke, and her vision was nearly gone, her consciousness fading, and there was nothing she could do. And then her mind gasped a single thought, so crisp and clear it was like a word scissored out of the black paper. Knife! Against every instinct, she made herself let go of the boy's hand and reached for her boot. Her fingers brushed fabric and then curled in a sudden convulsive spasm, bunching her pant leg, not because she was thinking anymore, but because she was dying. Her hand closed on hard plastic. With the last of her strength, she jerked the knife from its holder and drove the blade into the boy's left flank. The knife was very sharp, and she felt just an instant's hesitation as the tip met fabric. And then the nothing as it sliced cleanly all the way through the parka and the shirt beneath, buried itself to the hilt to the meat in, to the hilt in the meat of the boy's back. Arching, the boy shrieked, his hands flew away, and then she was gomping like a fish pulling air in great, wheezy gasps that cut her throat. Tumbling from her body, the boy was shrieking, his fingers closing over the knife handle, tugging, trying to work the blade free. Get up. The fog of her mind bled away. Gagging, she rolled onto her stomach and spotted the Glock, six inches away. Snatching up the gun, she twisted. Crabbing onto her back, she saw the boy on his knees, two feet away. Her knife, smeary with his blood, was in his hand now. His raging eyes locked onto her, and he bellowed. She squeezed the trigger. The shot was very loud. The glock bucked. The boy's chest bloomed red, and the warm, wet blowback of his blood misted her face. The boy flopped onto his back without a sound. She had time for nothing, not even relief. In the next instant, she heard the familiar papery rustle, turned, and saw a blimp boy surging forward. Tom's blood smeared over his mouth in an obscene leer. And then the fat boy loomed huge and horrible, only five feet away. He was there. He was right there. She shoved the gun at his face and fired. And that's chapter thirty six. Uh, chapter thirty five. Now we are at chapter thirty six. So yeah, Tom got fucked up some more. <laughs> oh, poor Tom. I was just trying to do his best in life. You know, he trying. He just 
trying to protect his people, you know, live his life. And he lost his people, has an infected leg, and just got his neck torn up. Um, uh, hashtag poor Tom. So what do you guys think of that chapter? Now we're going to do chapter 36. Wait, what chapter did I start on? Because I need to know. Because I've just been reading. Okay, I, I started at chapter 32. So, uh, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41. So I'm supposed to stop at 41. I need to write that down somewhere. Oh... Yeah. So anyway, chapter 36. Tom bled a long time, soaking through a balled up shirt and his own flannel before the flow finally slackened. Then he told her to use the bourbon. She didn't want to. She knew the alcohol would burn like hell, but she did what he said. And as soon as the bourbon hit the raw, macerated tissue, Tom's whole body went rigid, the cords standing out like wires on his neck, his teeth bared in a grimace. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, she said helplessly. The last thing she wanted to hurt him even more. The last thing she wanted was to hurt him even more. Already dark amber, the bourbon turned a muddy brownish purple as it mingled with Tom's blood. She used a scrape of torn shirt to wipe away the sweat from his face. It's okay, he said, his voice rusty with pain. There was a crust of blood underneath his shattered nose, and his eyes were beginning to puff. You're doing fine. I don't know what I'm doing, she said. She felt sick, not with fear now or hunger, but dread. The wound was very deep, enough to expose tendon and muscle and a glimmer of bone. The blood welling up wasn't pumping, and she dared to hope that he wouldn't bleed much more. But she knew she could never move him now. Tom was too weak. Too drained. He already had one infection, and she was pretty sure that human bites were as bad as animals, maybe worse. What about your leg? Should I wash? Cut it. She froze, unable, unwilling to believe her ears. What? Cut it, Tom whispered in that same pain roughened voice. Too much pus has to drain. I can't, she said, horrified. Tom, I can't, please. Alex, I can't, can't do it m myself. He paused, his chest heaving, his face oily with sweat. When he spoke again, his words broke with airy gasps. The knife. Use a f flare. S sterilize. But I'll burn you. Tom actually laughed. A faint splutter that quickly died. Least of my p problems. Skin's dead anyway. But the, the tissue underneath. 
we might be okay. But you have have to drain Alex. Alex, do it, please. His glittery, fever bright eyes locked her locked on hers, and she read his desperation and fear. Before I lo lose my nerve. That was like his story about Crow. For Tom Daxter to do something like this, he must know he didn't have many options left, or much time. But what if he was wrong? What if she did more harm than good? Outside, she retrieved her boot knife, prizing it from the dead boy's clutching fingers. Plunging the knife into deep snow got rid of most of the gore. Then she used bourbon and water to wash away the rest. At the convenience store's front door, she twisted off the cap of one of the flares and scraped the tip against the striker. The flare caught, the crimson flame spitting fiercely. The knife's handle was a hard black polymer, so she was able to hold it without burning herself as she heated the blade. Watching as the color changed from silver to a dull gold to a bright lava red. Tom, she said, kneeling over him. The knife had cooled to a dull orange, but she could feel the heat radiating in waves and knew the steel was still plenty hot. You're absolutely sure there isn't another way? C cut it. Fast as you can. I'll try n not to move. Once you're through skin, you'll have to... Have to cut deeper. Heat will help with the bleeding. When the pus starts coming, stop. You'll know when. He panted, turning his face away. He pulled in another gasping sob. His eyes screwed shut and his hands balled to fists. But a deep shudder was running through him now. A trembling he couldn't control. I'll try to stay on, on, on top of it. But no matter what I s say, don't stop, Alex. Finish the j job. Oh, please, God, she thought, staring down at Tom's thigh and the blackened, angry eye of his wound. Please save him. Please help me. She'd seen movies, scenes where men dug around for bullets with bare hands in movies. People passed out when the pain was too much. But this wasn't a movie or a book. This was, in fact, much, much worse because Tom did not pass out. And he lasted only three seconds before he began to scream. That's the best I can do. She thumbed his tears away. His pain-ravaged face was dead white. His eyes sunken into purple-black hollows. The fleshy lips of his wound gaped, and his thigh was streaked with thin riplets of bright red blood. But there seems to be very little pus left. The air rinked with the stink of dead meat, boiled pus, and cooked blood. The mats under his leg had gone soupy with the muck and she dragged them out, pitching them into the snow before retrieving the floor mats from the abandoned van. She'd used straight bourbon with, on the raw flesh of his thigh, but now she used a wad of torn shirt and stuffed with snow to mop sweat from his forehead. You smell like a bar. Yeah. His weary gaze fixed on her neck. A lot of bruises. Her throat still felt broken. You should see the other guy. Not, not a joke. That was too, too close. C can't lose you. I'm not going anywhere, she said, knowing deep down that she would be forced to. She sponged away dried blood from his chest. His torso was sti stippled with other older wounds, shiny with scar tissue. Sh shrapnel, he whispered, 
feeling the question in her fingers. Got myself fragged six months ago. You ought to see me light up metal detectors at an air airport. And this? She touched. What looked like small burn marks just under his armpit. Then she peered closer and made out letters. Eden. Thomas A. A series of numbers. Social security number, Alex thought. The line below read O-P-O-S. And then, belief, and then beneath that, Catholic. A tattoo, she said. Yeah, we call them meat tags. Sometimes there's not a lot left after he swallowed, you know. Tom, she reached up to stroke the damp hair from his forehead. His lips were pale, as transparent as glass. What are we going to do? Stick to, th to the plan. He tried a smile that quickly faded. We, we leave in the m morning. All I need is a little rest. He needed a lot more, and she knew it. She spent the night on a mound of car mats in the convenience store's back room. A few hours before dawn, Tom either passed out or fell asleep. She couldn't tell which. Stretching out along his left side, she hugged his body to hers. So close, she heard his heart. She was exhausted, but afraid to sleep. Oof, excuse me. Worried that he would be dead when she woke up. But eventually, her thoughts thinned, and she spiraled down, and The dream again. The one where she saw the chopper. The one carrying her mother and father take off in that snowstorm. The helicopter rose like a helium-filled balloon, higher and higher, until at the very limit of the sky and the edge of the night, it exploded in a fireball. Alex hadn't been there. She waited at home, alone, as the storm raged, while her mom did her doctor thing, accompanying a patient on an emergency evac. The only reason her dad was even aboard was that the med tech, freaked by the storm, chickened out, and her dad trained in ACLS because all cops or first responders took his, pay took his place. The chopper had not bloomed into a fireball either. After delivering the patient safe and sound, the helicopter took off for home and simply crashed into a hillside. No drama, no 4th of July. Although the fire had been so intense that they'd identified the pilot and her parents by their teeth. She was 14. She felt nothing when her parents died. No premonition, no seismic shudder, no chasm opening beneath her feet. She had been awake, watching the snow swirl in golden nimbus around the streetlight at the end of the block, waiting for her father's patrol car to turn the corner. She would even pictured how that would look. First its lights, then the cruiser itself, pulling together out of the snow like something from a dream. And then a cruiser had appeared, although she'd known immediately that it wasn't her father's. His was a newer model, white and black. The one that pulled into the driveway was older, all black. Still, she didn't think anything of it, even when she saw the officers unfold and flounder towards the front porch. Even when she recognized her father's old partner, she still didn't understand what was happening. Leaving her seat by the window, patting the front door in her slippers, she didn't get it. Throwing open the deadbolt, opening the door, feeling the gust of cold air push in, she didn't get it. She never got it. It just never dawned on her that anything ha horrible had happened until she recognized the minister from their church. And then she got it. A month later, the nightmare started. A year later, when the smoke smell started, and Aunt Hannah sent her to that shrink, she'd spun some crap about Alex being Dorothy and her parents flying away to Oz, blah, blah, blah. For the shrink, the dream was all about Alex's fantasy that her parents were still alive somewhere. 
Alex thought the shrink was full of shit. Her parents were dead, and she knew that. The dream was all about her life, jumping the rails, blowing up in her face, leaving her with nothing but ashes, which was happening now with Tom all over again. When she awoke, Tom's skin was clammy. His fever raged, and his heart was rabbiting in his chest. And she knew she couldn't wait any longer. She had to bring help, or Tom would die. He might die before she returned, but she couldn't just sit and wait either. Tom wanted her to take the gun. You might need it. His skin was whiter than salt, so translucent, she saw the faint blue worm of tiny veins under his eyes. At least the shakes had vanished, if only temporarily. I'm not going anywhere. That's not what I'm worried about. If anyone gets in here, the gun's all you have. If someone breaks in, if it's a couple of those things, a few bullets won't make any difference. Besides, I don't think they're smart enough to do that. They're too one-dimensional. Oh, wait, page, please. Page. Thank you. She wasn't so she wasn't so sure the brain zapped kids were as dumb as all that. They knew enough to stay warm, but she saw what he meant. While the kids could easily have overwhelmed them both, if they'd planned their attack and acted together, they hadn't. The girl had a club, and that kid I stabbed figured out the knife pretty quick, but they worked separately. What if that changes? Tom lifted a hand to touch her face. His fingers were ice. Please, take it. If something happens to you, then it won't matter about me. Privately, she thought she stood a better chance of being shot if she advertised the gun. Given her age, she might be shot on sight anyway. All right, she said. Then she surprised herself and leaned down and kissed him. She meant to pull back, but his other hand snaked into her hair to cut the back of her head, and the kiss turned into something she didn't want to end, that she worried might never happen again. Her heart filled and her blood warmed, and Tom's scent, spicy and strange, bloomed, nearly overpowering the choke of sickness and decay. Whatever Tom's secrets, this was no lie. When she finally broke away, he said weakly, At last, something to live for. His face splintered into shimmery prisms, and she knew she would never leave if she started crying. Don't you dare die on me. I'm not gone yet. But then that twist of emotion, furtive and fleet, chased through his face again. Alex, what happened before we lost Ellie? I need to tell you no. She put a hand to his lips. If he told her, would he die? Isn't that what happened when people made confessions in books and movies? Don't. It doesn't matter now. Tell me when I see you again. He captured her hand. But it does matter. I need you to know. Please, just listen. He paused, shutting his eyes against some other hidden pain. I'm here, she said. I'm listening. You were right. A single tear trickled from the corner of one eye to disappear into his hair. About me looking for my fate. I won't... I can't tell you everything now. It's not the right time. But I want you to know... He opened his eyes, his feverish gaze holding her fast. I found it. I found my fate. Me too, she said. It meant it. For the first time in what felt like forever, she wanted a future, and she wanted Tom in it. She kissed him again, memorizing the feel and the taste in his scent. Then she shut the door and locked it and left him there. Goodbye, Tom. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Tom. I don't know if Tom's going to 
gonna be all right. <laughs> You'll be fine. So we're up to chapter 37. Let me see. Uh, I'm going to read chapter 37. And then we'll end it for now. Five chapters because uh, I'm a little out of walk, to be honest. And I don't really know what to do for that. Excuse me. Um, I really should have drawn the kids to give myself a break, to be honest, but I just didn't want to. And my voice just sounds kind of dead today. So I'm going to end it pretty short today. I have five chapters. And I guess I'll just do a different stream a little bit later. Of just working on designs, uh, emotes. I'm going to finish the emotes. And yeah. That is what we shall do. Give me a second. Hiya, Katie. <sighs> Hi. Chapter 37. She wasn't an idiot. If she kept to main roads, kept moving west and south, she would run into people way before she got to rule. This might be good and bad. Bad because the survivors were more likely to shoot first and ask questions later. But maybe good because all those brain zapped kids she's seen hung close to the woods. If she paid attention, Maybe she'd smell them coming, too. She slogged steadily southwest, through a good two feet of snow, keeping to the road. Her eyes always scanning, searching for movement, for brain-zapped kids, for grandmothers with rifles who thought she might be a meal ticket. There were billboards, too, advertising gas stations, and mine tours and gift shops. She spotted a sign for Northern Light, God's light in dark times. And a few others suggested that people stop in at Martha's Diner. Breakfast 24-7. The day was fine, sunny and very bright, and not as cold. If the way had been level and the road clear, cross-country skis or snowshoes would have been nice. Sunglasses, too. As welcome as the sun was, her eyes streamed against the wink and dazzle of the glare bouncing off snow. The road was clogged with cars and vans and trucks hunkering beneath a mantle of snow. Most were wrecks with smashed windows or doors that yawned like mouths. She kept her eyes peeled for their truck, half hoping she wouldn't find it because she was afraid to know what that really meant. Clouds of birds circled in the sky while crows lined the trees and perched on the icy wires, and studied her passage in absolute silence. She felt as if she stumbled into a movie set, the kind where the camera pans back to reveal destruction and devastation, all the way to the horizon with no end in sight. And then her, the only thing moving other than the birds. Away from the woods, the air was sullen with smells. Engine oil, gasoline, rubber, and death. The stink was so thick and cloying that she gagged, and she wished she had something to tie around her mouth and nose. There were a lot of bodies, all in various stages of decomposing. Many had died in their cars. Others, men and women who had stumbled from their cars only to collapse on the road that first day, wore shrouds of snow. 
Even with the cold to slow down the rot, the corpses were hideous, as bloated as those dead cows she and Tom and Ellie had seen. There were many animals, too. Fat raccoons with paws full of meat, mangy foxes and opossums, their white snouts clogged with gore, braving the daylight for the feast. And of course, there were always the birds, jabbing and pecking and stripping away frozen niblets of flesh right down to the bone. One pair of very large crows squabbled over something in the snow. At her approach, they fluttered off, and she spotted what she thought was a fat drop of blood, only to realize that she was staring down at a woman's dis disart disarticulated big toe. The nail still painted a bright cherry fire engine red. All the dead were adults. Most looked old enough to be parents, but not grandparents. There were empty car seats and discarded lunch pails and book bags, but no kids. No bodies of anyone close to her age or Tom's. Then she saw something that made her blood ice. The further down the road she went, the more prints she found from the people who'd survived. Boots, sneakers, everyday shoes, even some flip-flops and footprints. Not socks, bare feet. That gave her a pause. Deer laid, down Deer laid down trails, taking the same path to and from streams and meadows. Ducks and geese flew routes they'd taken before. All a hunter had to do was either hunker down and wait or follow his prey. People took roads. Honestly, they might as well have been wearing cowbells because it looked to her like those brain zap kids weren't simply sticking to the woods now. They might live there but they'd figure out that they, if they wanted to eat, they had to go where the food was. Then she noticed something else. Then she noticed something else. Some of the dead people were very old. They had died because they'd been shot in the back, some in the chest, and many in the back of the head. Their clothing had not been tattered or ripped by animals, but it seemed simply taken. These bodies were fresher, too, and lay in bunches in a scatter of discarded empty knapsacks and duffel bags and suitcases. These people had survived only to be robbed and then killed by their own kind. The Harlins, the Bretts, the Marjories. And that's when she finally understood that Larry had been right. Had been right. Oh, Jesus. Please leave me. Oh, God, hold on. I'll be right back.
Sorry, my aunt had called me. Let me see. Let me give her the thingy before I... Yeah, I'm going to give it to her after this because I have to finish reading. All right. Yeah, my aunt had called me about some Fortnite stuff. Uh, those brains have kids weren't the only, or maybe even the worst, enemy. As she passed by a panel truck, doors open, two ravaged and nearly skeletonized bodies dragging from shoulder harnesses. She heard something that was not the harsh caw of a bird. The sound was pathetic, a whimper almost like the cry of a baby. She looked down and saw an old man and an older woman sprawled face down near the truck and a scattered of pilfered duffels. They'd been shot in the back of the head not too long ago, judging from the lack of snow cover. The woman's coat was bunched up, so Alex could see the spread of her fleshy thighs, ropey with bulging and green varcaceous veins. Above her support stockings, the woman was flat on her face, her arms flung out in a reverse snow angel. Alex spotted a loop of leather around the woman's right wrist and more leather snaking beneath the truck. Then she caught the scent, something very familiar. Oh my God, she said out loud. Dropping to her knees, Alex searched the shadows underneath under the truck. Cowering near to the right front tower was a shivering gray pup, puppy. She had no idea what the puppy was, though it looked like a cross between some kind of hound and a Labrador. When it saw her, it whined, then scooted toward her, just an inch on its belly. The stub of his tail moved in a hopeful wag. All of a sudden, rescuing the dog felt important. If she could save the dog, it would be a good sign, like an omen. If she saved the dog, she'd save, she'd save Tom, too. Later, she'd think about how illogical this was, but that didn't make the feeling any less strong at the time. She tore open a pack of beef jerky and offered a piece to the pup. At the smell, the puppy inched forward again, its nose brushing her fingers, and then it wolfed down the meaty bit, only to spit it out a few seconds later, whimpering. The pup pushed the jerky with its nose, and she understood that the meat was too tough, tough for the dog to chew. She shoved another piece in her mouth, working it into mush. The rich flavor of spicy smoked beef was so good, her stomach cramped. It took all her self-control not to swallow. When she spat out the meat, she heard herself groan. This time, though, the dog snapped the food up right away, then scooched forward for more. Three more pieces of jerky, and the puppy squirted out from beneath the truck, grunting like a little pig and squiggling and wagging the cropped gray pencil. What? English? What? All right, I'm almost done because, like, my brain is like, bitch, what is going on? Gray pencil stub of his tail. I'm clipping the leash from his collar. She gathered the dog in her arms. So what's your name? The puppy let go of a little yap. The dog's coat was short and silvery gray. And it, he, had very blue eyes and big paws. Must weigh a good ten pounds. She fed the puppy the rest of the jerky, then scrounged in the discarded duffels and came up with three cans of puppy food, a foul packet of puppy kibbles, and a small aluminum water bowl into which she poured a scant two inches from her bottle. Afterward, she buttoned the dog up in her jacket, cinching the belt around her waist so the puppy couldn't slip out. When she was done, she looked either a little bit pregnant or in need of a very large bra. The puppy was very warm. When it poked his head out to watch the sights, she started laughing. I got you, she said, as the puppy waggled all over and kissed her fingers. I got you, don't you work. That was when she smelled the wolves. Woo! Man, for her having crazy good scent, sometimes she just gets way too distracted to smell shit. But yeah, that's where we're going to stop it for now. Uh, My brain is just not working how I wish it would work. following that guy named Jalen. Welcome to the palace. I hope you enjoy your stay here. I'm going to end this stream right now, but I'm going to reopen it again in a minute. 
So we can start. I just need to change the title and everything because I don't want this part to be connected to this because this goes into a playlist for people to listen to. So yeah, uh, I will be right back. I'm just going to change up the title and stuff and we're going to get started on some artwork. Yeah. So I'm going to stop this and I'll be right back. Hold on. <laughs> 